Um, well, uh, con consequently, Schrodinger is a 320 kilometer diameter basin. Um, it is in the South Pole region. It actually um, it is one of the youngest lunar basins, only marginally older than Oriental. It, the impactor actually struck the rim, approximately at least, of South Pole Aiken. Um, the basin has been targeted as an ideal location for a future landing site because the samples may provide ages for South Pole Aiken and Schrodinger that would bracket the basin forming epoch. And um, it is thought that um, that Schrodinger has actually tapped some deep crustal or mantle even lithologies and materials that are associated with South Pole Aiken or just mantle materials. Um, it also contains younger volcanic deposits, um, mare and, and pyroclastic. So right now we're working on a, um, a new geologic map that incorporates LRO WAC as the base map. Um, WAC and NAC both being used for geomorphology, LOLA. And M cube data, um, which we're obviously um, getting mineralogy or compositional information about the um, basin units, and um, we're also using spectral parameter images to help along with that. And this map is trying to utilize cross-discipline um, uh, geologic tools, such as or uh, specialties including photogeology, spectroscopy, structural geology, and impact cratering and mechanics. Um, the, you know, so of course my main focus is going to be on the moon mineralogy mapper. And M cubed is really fantastic because not only is it a spectrometer, but it's an imaging spectrometer. So you get context or and geologic context um, um, to your spectrum. Um, and here's just a little, you know, brief tutorial just to make you all believe that spectroscopy is not a hack science. The minerals are identified by the their albedo, the shape of the continuum, and absorption features in the reflectance spectrum. Um, these absorptions, they are caused by electronic transfers between a metal ion and its surrounding ligands, which are usually this uh, metal ion usually being iron, and the ligands being oxygen. The location and shape reflects the energy associated with the electron transfer and the coordination environment of the cation with respect to its ligands. Um, as well as other adjacent cations in the crystal lattice. Other factors such as weathering and vitrification, or how glassy your sample is, um, can be diagnosed based on their effect on the continuum. So, I have to gripe on this a lot because Schrodinger is the most polar place I've ever looked at before, and David Crane heard a lot of complaining about it for me because of these, um, this horrible sun angle. Um, it made uh, looking at, at you know, broad spectral features impossible. I had to look at these tiny little spectral features from sun-facing slopes because of the fact that the sun angle is so steep and um, um, only you'll get like half of everything lit up and the other half in complete darkness. So because the, uh, this, the um, solar radiance signal is so low, it causes a um, uh, increase in the noise level. Um, the upside is that there's little to no thermal emission, so we don't have to worry about removing that to get a true reflectance spectrum. Although it does limit locations for extracting the spectra from the sunlit facing sides. Um, and in comparison, this is what a uh, low latitude surface spectra would look like. This is um, some spectra that I took from, um, um, I think it was Frank Crater in Tranquilitatis or near Tranquilitatis. And it's um, these are actually taken of the surface. They are from a fresh um, impact, but it's from the proximal ejecta, so it's on a flattish surface. And here is sort of the equivalent spectra of if you're looking at a flat surface in the Schrodinger region. So, again, I'm taking these spectra from the sun-lit facing sides. And in this way, they are um, bright enough to actually identify the mineralogy. I hope you guys can see this. I think, yeah, okay. So here I've made a, um, what I'm calling it, it's an exposed positive, identif positive identification mineral map. Um, as you can see, they're all sudden lit facing sides. Um, and, um, well, that's not very legible. Um, well, okay. The basin walls on the rim and the proximal ejecta is composed of um, a low calcium proxene and plagioclase, so it really is a true norite. And it is also the um, composition of the surrounding region in general. Um, 
the mess of the central melt sheet. <laughs> oh, that's right, right. The impact melt sheet <laughs> um, is calculated be to be between, I think, it, I think it says there, 1.3 and 3.7 kilometers thick. And we actually measured a crater right there, um, which shows how thin it gets as it, as it tapers out. This is a 12-kilometer um, in diameter crater, which has punched through the impact melt sheet and is exposing the, um, the neuritic floor below. So here comes the exciting part, right? These are the peak ring exposures um, like that were observed by Kaguya, where they saw um, with the point spectrometer olivine and um, with their multiband imager, they identified plagioclase. Did we see it? You betcha. And then some. Um, Schrodinger impact actually excavated about 20 kilometers into the lunar crust, but the peak ring material was uplift, uplifted from about 70 kilometers down. These are, you know, crater scaling relationships. But since Schrodinger impact has actually hit um, into a material that had, or into an area already excavated by South Pole Aiken, there is a really good chance that we really are tapping mantle material this time in the peak ring. And the fact that there's olivine, 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 and orthosite, orthosite, everywhere, it looks good. Here's a close-up of um, this one adorable crater, which is like tiger-striped. <laughs> um, it's actually exposing three different minerals, olivine and green, um, and red orthoperoxine, and the um, purple spectrum is showing you a nice orthosite and the, excuse me, the blue one, and the magenta one is showing you a mix of north site and orthoproxene, one crater. Um, some of the spectral characteristics of a mafic glass-rich material are well exposed in um, the spectrum from the sun-facing slope of the pyroclastic volcanic vent. Um, here is the vent in uh, close-up, and you see this white dot right here? That's that. And this is where I pulled the spectrum from. A nice little outcrop, and um, it's very glassy looking. Is it wet? Wet Schrodinger. Um, virtually all of the basin material exhibits unmistakable hydroxyl absorption features, testifying to the prevalence of OH in the polar regions. However, the Mare, and, and especially the pyroclastic unit, does not exhibit the OH absorption feature found throughout the rest of Schrodinger. So here is a um, 750 nanometer reflectance image. This is a 2.82 micron band depth. This is where the OH absorption feature is located. Um, if it is, it, the dark areas are showing you where the OH abundance is low relative to the surrounding. And if we zoom in even more onto the vent, Okay, this is the actual fresh impact into the low OH pyroclastic deposit, um, showing that it is even lower in OH, um, even than the pyroclastic deposits around it. So what are the implications of this? Hmm. Well, the uh, glasses that have, were measured by Saul and Hari et al. Um, are wet. These aren't very wet. Shameless plug. <laughs> I want to thank Amanda Nam and Timu Oman for their help doing this project. Of course, the Lunar Plan Planetary Institute and especially the Lunar Science Institute. <laughs> Histamine reaction or not, there is plenty of time for questions. You want to do it again. <laughs> Questions? Jeff. About the glasses, uh, they aren't so wet after they outgas. And unless those, the water is deposited very nearby, you may not ever see them, uh, except inside places like trap melt and things like that. So you may not. It may not be possible to see him.
Other questions? Um, can I ask you to just elaborate, Irene Antonenko, University of Western Ontario, can you elaborate a little bit more on, um, you had that map with the speckles of the various different uh, um, mineralogy. Um, can you elaborate a little more on how you got that map? Yeah, if, can you make that thing appear again? That'd be wonderful. <laughs> it was excruciating. <laughs> <laughs> It was semi-automatic, but I had to check each one because the, the automatic, if you will, function, you know, can sometimes give you false positives. On the what? Um, Not that one. Well, so, so we can use the spectral data to make the spectral parameter images like the 2.82 micron. Oh yeah, no, that's that's fine. It's actually a an afterwards slide. Sorry. Come on. Some cool stuff. It's in here, I promise. There we go. Okay. So, um, so this is showing some of the, the circum basin materials, um, and if you can see them, there's a, each of these has a yellow and a red, and then the one up there also has a magenta spectrum. And the yellow ones are showing you where the, it's a, a higher calcium peroxine, so the, um, both of the um, ma mafic absorption features are shifted a little bit to longer wavelengths, especially the two micron, you can see that better. Um, a, and this parameter image is, is based on that, it, it's sort of, you know, it's like, it's like looking for where the uh, maximum absorption is shifted to longer, longer wavelengths. But uh, it's also based on having taken continuum away. These are all continuum removed um, spectra. So um, because of the noisiness and because of the low light, uh, Schrodinger false positives can come up a lot. So that's why I had to go out and check everything. Yeah. Alberto is there right behind you. Detection limit in the OH measurements that you do? Hmm. You know, I would even have to say it's a work in progress. So uh, the those those um, to quantify what those what those images are showing is actually a percent band depth. Um, I actually I don't I don't really know what the detection limits are, and we are still. Uh, exploring the, um, the the parameter and um, the calibration associated, or that we need to um, first do to get to that parameter. I was intrigued by you, when you said that the impact melt material had a deeper OH band than the pyroclastic material and the Mari basalt. How do you do that? I didn't do it. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> How, how, how can you get that in impact melt material? Is it absorbed onto the surface or? Well, there seems to be like a kind of blanket or background OH signal um, all over the place. And it, it, it's really more like the pyroclastic and, and that Mari, uh, apparently a thin Mari basalt flow on top, are OH poor instead of the impact melt being OH rich because even the surrounding uh, um, basin Highlands hmm. is about the same level. Wow. So it's not a hack science. Is that what you said earlier on? I didn't uh, say that. Okay. No. All right, Clive. Carly, Carly's here. Carly's <laughs> here. Oh, oh, oh. Come on, Clive. We're all in trouble now. <laughs> um, okay, off. It's too late. we got to move on. <laughs> okay. Um, I know you're a petrologist, and we have lots of esteemed petrologists here, and you really do want to know whether some of these uh, features have the wonderful uh, uh, gla of water that we see in the pyroclastics. Mm -hmm. Yes. What, what, what George is showing is the surficial water. This is yep. the water okay. that, you know, interacts with the solar wind, and, and it has a different physics mm -hmm. and probably a different origin. So the distribution is, is uh, remarkable, and in that it is spatially variable. 
um, but its origin is not the same. And actually, what is interesting relative to the questions is that, that the abundance we see in the surficial is more prominent than the little bit of water we should see in the glass. So that's an interesting wow. question to be pursuing. In the because for some reason, those surfaces don't like to grab the... Oh, yeah, and that, that's a good physics question. We don't Thursday know. Morning. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're going to have to...